Okay, well, um, today uh, what we're going to do is record three videos pertaining to Nietzsche's Twilight of the Idols. Uh, this is one of the later works of Nietzsche, um, a theorist. I've got to say, um, you can see from what's left of my uh, copy of the portable here that I've been reading Nietzsche for quite some time. Uh, and uh, really, um, I think I, I mentioned this when I teach Nietzsche, if somebody asks me the question, who is your favorite philosopher and why, uh, the answer would be Nietzsche. Not because I think he's right or that I think the position is complete or that it's not in need of revision, but largely because of the capacity of this work to make us think in a fundamentally different way about Western culture. And then on top of that, He's the first philosopher that actually made me laugh out loud. Right? I didn't think philosophy could be funny. I thought it could be insightful. I thought it could be interesting. I thought it could be a lot of things. But funny, I didn't think that was one of the things that philosophy could do until I came across Nietzsche. Now, um, the book at hand is, of course, The Portable Nietzsche, um, and it's a nice book because um, you get complete texts in it. Um, it's sort of designed to be anybody's first introduction to Nietzsche. It's translated by a guy by the name of Walter Kaufman, <coughs> who um, is a, a pretty standard uh, translation uh, of Nietzsche's German works into English. Um, it, it, he's, he's sort of, eh, sort of authoritative um, with regard to that. Now, what we're going to get from Nietzsche is not um, a critique on the basis of most of the standards that we're used to. Right? Um, it, we're not asking questions like, is that argument valid? Or is that claim true, right? Um, largely what we're going to get from this work is a dispositional critique um, of the sorts of values uh, that we adopt and we attempt to live. Um, in some cases, he's going to point out that we don't really have the courage of our convictions with regard to our values. Um, that's certainly his position uh, with regard to um, elements of his critique of Christianity. Uh, and uh, it, it, to a certain extent, he's going to critique the values themselves. If we did adopt them and really live these values, what that would do is put us in a position where uh, we would have to acknowledge that these values are unhealthy or that they fail to affirm, but rather deny life. So, um, <coughs> I usually start off by reading uh, a section from uh, the Joyful Wisdom, or as it's translated here, the Gay Science. You can find it on your in your portable on uh, page 95. This is a very classic passage from Nietzsche. Just about anybody who teaches Nietzsche starts off by quoting the two passages that I am about to quote here. Right? So this is sort of a standard introduction to Nietzsche. Um, it, uh, but a word of caution before I quote these passages, Nietzsche, Nietzsche's work it tends to be quoted out of context and misappropriated for a number of ends, which it, Nietzsche, given the robust nature of his full position, uh, would wholly oppose. Um, and so it, to a certain extent, we're risking misinterpret misinterpretation of Nietzsche by um, quoting just two little passages from the larger work, The Joyful Wisdom or The Gay Science. But nonetheless, um, it's hopefully I'm going to be able to illustrate something with these two passages. So on page 95 of your text, um, it's The Gay Science, um, page 125, section called The Madman. Have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours and ran into the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. As many of those who do not believe in God were standing around just then, he provoked much laughter. Why? Did he get lost? said one. Did he lose his way like a child? said another. Where is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Is he gone on a voyage or emigrated? 
Thus they yelled and laughed. The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his glances. Whither is God, he cried, I shall tell you. We have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how have we done this? How were we able to drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What did we do when we unchained the earth from its sun? Whither is it moving now? Whither are we moving now, away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, backward, sideward, forward, in all directions? Is there any up or down left? Are we not straying as through, uh, as through an infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night and more night coming on all the while? Must not lanterns be lit in the morning? Do we not hear anything yet of the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we not smell anything yet of the God's decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? What was holiest and most powerful of all the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement? What sacred game shall we have to invent? Is, is <clears throat> excuse me, is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must not we ourselves become God simply to become uh, simply to seem worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed, and whoever will be born after us for the sake of this deed. He will be part of a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the man, madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners. They too were silent and, and stared at him in astonishment. <clears throat> at last he threw his lantern on the ground and it broke and went out. I come too early, he said, he said then. My time is not yet. Er, is, er, er, excuse me, my time has not come yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering, it has not yet reached the ears of man. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars requires time. Deeds require time, even after they are done, before they can be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars, yet they have done it themselves. It is related further. On that same day that the madman entered the divers churches and there using his um, Requiem Aeternum Dio let out and called to account. He said uh, he is said to have replied each time. What are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchres of God? Like I say this is a very famous passage. And as Broderick points out, um, this is a very central claim for Nietzsche. Nietzsche believes that we live at a very important point in cultural history. The central claim is that God is dead. And it's not actually, it's, as, as Broderick points out, it's not actually Nietzsche's claim. He's not the first one to have claimed it. Uh, that was Hegel. But nonetheless, Nietzsche, it's attributed most vehemently to Nietzsche, that God is dead. Now, yeah, Roderick goes into a very good sort of discussion of this. You might remember that from the beginning of the Kierkegaard video. He discusses it, not the actual literal death of a metaphysical being, but rather this claim is more of a cultural claim. It's one where, you know, the belief structure that we've built can no longer hold the position that it once held. Something that by its very nature should be central and permeate the whole of our lives is now relegated to a small part of our lives. Uh, so belief in God, the whole institution of the metaphysical belief system pertaining to a God who is in heaven, who knows all, who loves all, 
who judges all, traditionally acted as a support mechanism for not only moral truth, I mean, moral truth is where we go first with it, but nonetheless, scientific truth as well. This is how we think of the truth. But interestingly, that narrative no longer holds the position that it once did and no longer, no longer serves the function that it once did. Right. Roderick uses the sort of time slice analysis of our lives, a life that is segmented into a work, day, work week, five work days, right? And then a relaxation day, maybe Saturday, right? And then a holy day, which is Sunday, right? So religion, God, belief, all of this happens in this one small little aspect of our lives when by its very nature, by its very, it, 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 by its very implication, it should permeate the whole of our lives. Right? So as Roderick points out in right, the video that I gave you, it's not, it's not so much that Nietzsche is claiming that there aren't believers who really believe it's just that the mechanism of belief no longer holds the kind of prominence that by, by its very nature it needs to right so effectively right this belief in God is dead right now we should notice something about this, and I mean, let's go back to '95 here. What we, uh, what did we do when we unchained the Earth from its sun? Whether is it moving now? Uh, whether are we moving now away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually backward, sideward, forward in all directions? Is there any up or down, left? Are we not straying as through an infinite nothing? Uh, do we not feel the breadth of empty space? Has it not become colder? Is not night and more night coming on all the while, etc., etc.? Does he sound happy about this? Is this, you know, an event without consequence? Nietzsche would point out, of course not. All right now. One of the things that, that this, this, this metaphysical system did is gave us a whole context of meaning to justify our beliefs that we mobilize in our daily life. Right? We believe that morality holds. God stands there as a guarantor. We believe that a human life is a significant thing. God stands there as a guarantor. We believe that our choices matter. God stands there as a guarantor. We can't simply draw an X through a belief system and move on as though there is nothing has occurred, right, according to Nietzsche. This was structural to the meaning-giving activities of a human being. Right? One more point that I will point out here on page 96. Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must not we ourselves become God simply to seem worthy of it? There has never been a greater deed and whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed, he will be part of a higher history than all history hither to. Now, interestingly, as, 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 as concerned as Nietzsche is, that this belief system has collapsed. Like I say, it's a, it's a cultural claim right? that Nietzsche is making here. Right? This belief system no longer serves as a justification and a guarantor of uh, the smaller beliefs that we mobilize in daily life. Right? Well, the tragedy isn't that this event has occurred for Nietzsche, as we'll see from our read of Twilight of the Idols, right? He's going to point out some pretty fundamental problems with the belief system. The tragedy is that 
well, to a certain extent, just like the the, 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 the listeners who fell silent, they didn't even see that this deed had occurred, that this event had occurred even after it's already done. Right? People do not see the implications of this. The tragedy right, for Nietzsche is not that this has occurred, it's that we have not rise to the occasion of its occurrence. Right? So when we turn to Twilight of the Idols, right, these, the idols, the values that are associated with this metaphysical belief system, ones that you wouldn't, that are presupposed and as natural as a sunrise to us. We don't see that they're linked to this metaphysics. We still rely upon them, but oddly, without this metaphysics and without a passionate belief in this metaphysics, they don't hold. They're groundless. They're baseless. Right? Now, look at the past, well, you might argue, 150 years of history, right? of cultural history. But it just just to clarify, if we look at the past 40 years of cultural history, do we not get the sense that we are much more morally uncertain? And we're much more uncertain about what a human life means, how to make a claim about how people should live it, how to ground a claim that, 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 that involves the word ought. You ought to do this, you oughtn't do that. Right? What Nietzsche wants to claim is without the force of this cultural institution standing as guarantor for a lot of those claims, right? without a faith in the metaphysical truth that is precisely what pins these claims to the ground, according to greater than 2,000 years of cultural history. Without this metaphysics, it's no surprise that our beliefs in moral truths have become a whole lot more smudgy. A whole lot more smudgy. And it's not surprising that a general malaise, the sort of thing that a Canadian philosopher by the, uh, the, 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 the name of Charles Taylor right, tried to do sort of an anatomy of in one of his beautiful Mass A lectures, the malaise of modernity. It's a cultural sickness has set in where we feel helpless, where we feel like our actions and our lives might not matter. This is what Nietzsche was critiquing as a form of advanced nihilism. Right? That, of course, is going to overtake a culture when its fundamental belief structure collapses. And then it does nothing about it. Right? Alain de Baton's video that I shared with you actually mentions that Nietzsche thought that cultural institutions should take the place of this metaphysical but that's not, yeah, I'm not sure Elaine de Baton is quite right about that. Sure, cultural institutions have a role to play, right? But uh, yeah, as I understand Nietzsche, what he wants us to do is create for ourselves a new belief structure, a new unifying narrative, right? Which, yes, emerges through cultural practices, right? but nonetheless, one that can ground our beliefs, one that can give meaning to our lives, one that can paint a picture of our place in the universe that allows things to matter. Right? So what we'll turn to next is, um, it starts on page 101, and it's a thought experiment by Nietzsche that asks you to take a good, long, hard look about your life 
and how you relate to it. Right? It's called The Greatest Stress. It's Gay Science 341. It's on your page 101. And it reads, Have us some day or night. A demon were to sneak after you in your loneliest loneliness, that's in your lowest moment, and say to you, This life... As you now live it and have lived it, you will have to live once more and innumerable times more. And there will be nothing new in it, but every pain and every joy and every thought and sigh and everything immeasurably small or great in your life must return to you, all in the same succession and sequence, even this spider and this moonlight <clears throat> between the trees and even this moment and I myself, the eternal hourglass of existence turned over and over and you with it, a dust grain of dust. Now let's wrap our minds around this thought experiment. I've heard interpretations of this. I've read interpretations of this kind of like the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray where he keeps on waking up and listening to the same song on the radio and keeps experiencing the same day over and over and over and over and over again. The difference between the bad Bill Murray movie and what Nietzsche's arguing here is that Bill Murray could do different things. Bill Murray could make different choices. It wouldn't be literally the same thing over and over and over again for Bill Murray because he could get up and turn left rather than turn right. He could remember from the last time he did it and mobilize his knowledge of the personal life of a woman in order to flirt with her. He could, you know, become the town hero. He could become the town villain. He could do whatever he wanted because his life would reset and he'd get another chance. That's absolutely no significance to the choices that you're making at that one moment. Right? It doesn't matter if everything resets to zero. And it's quite the opposite that Nietzsche is talking about. This life as you now live it and have lived it, everything you've done, everything you've experienced, every choice you've made, every relationship you've had, the most embarrassing thing that's ever happened to you, exactly how it happened over and over and over and over again with absolutely no alteration. The moment is completely what it is, what it was, what it's always been. All of it, without exception. So ask yourself, how do you feel about that? If a demon approached you at your lowest moment and asked you if you'd like this life once more and innumerable times more over and over and over again how would you feel about that? Uh -huh. So he continues here Would you not throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus? Or did you once experience a tremendous moment when you would have answered him, you were a god, and never have I heard anything more godly? If this thought were to gain possession of you, it would change you as you are, or perhaps crush you. The question in each and every thing, do you want this once more and innumerable times more, would weigh upon your actions as the greatest stress, or how well disposed would you have to become to yourself and to life, to crave nothing more feverently than this ultimate eternal confirmation and seal. Now I've called this a thought experiment. I've heard interpretations, I've read interpretations of this where Nietzsche actually ascribes to a cyclical physics and a cyclical account of history. I don't buy it. I just really don't buy that. Right? It's what I believe, what I, based on my fairly extensive reading of Nietzsche's materials, is that this is a thought experiment that has you take your head out of the clouds, take your head out of some sort of heavenly hereafter right? that may or may not come. Right? Or what's more common in terms of our interpretation of our lives, 
you know, there is some day way down the line, maybe when we're middle aged, everything will just gel and we'll have the house and the white picket fence and the golden retriever and the 2.5 kids and two cars in our garage and a cottage up in the upper peninsula or something like that. Right. This is some time down the line, everything right now, it's not good, but eventually it's going to get better and et cetera, et cetera. And we keep on living for this moment, like this moment is a carrot on the end of a stick. Keeps us going, right? Life sucks now, but someday it'll be better. Everything will gel and everything will suddenly be all right. Well, these belief systems right, are the sorts of things that, well, first off, that speculation about your life eventually down the line justifies a lot of horrible right here and now. And here's the funny thing. Once you get 10 years down the line, you're still struggling away. You're still dealing with stuff that you don't want to deal with. Right? And you're still fostering the same disposition to the here and now justified by a future that's somehow mythically going to be better over here. Right? That is sort of an unhealthy disposition to your life because as you're living it, you're not seeing value in it. See, it's nihilistic. Right? The afterlife as we saw from the previous passage, the madman is now something that along with God and along with the whole metaphysical belief system, we just it sort of can't really use to give meaning to our lives anymore, right? as a culture, culturally. Right. So effectively, what Nietzsche's done in this greatest stress is taken your head out of the clouds, taken your head out of some sort of potential possible future, and shoved it right back down into your life, and forced you through this thought experiment to ask yourself, how do you like the life that you're living? This one, right now, not some sort of ideal self in some sort of floaty, airy-fairy, realm of the form sort of potential future, right? But this life right now that you're living it, how do you feel about it? Okay. If you, it, as you suggest, would throw yourself down and gnash your teeth and curse the demon who spoke thus, well, what do you got to change in your life? What sort of choices what sort of deeds do you have to produce in order to become equal to the idea of this life as you now live it infinitely? Right? Or do you have elements of your life as you've lived it that for the sake of which you would take the whole of the rest of it? Uh, the trick is, at your lowest moment, in your loneliest loneliness, to be able to say, Oh, is that life? I'll bring it on again. Bring it on again. Right? The trick is, for Nietzsche, to become equal to your life. Right? Something that... Every time I ask students this question, it's a really slim minority of the students that are in the class that say, oh yeah, yeah, this life, as I'm now living it, I'd love it. Yeah, bring it on again. Yes, I would like it. Half the time I think they're saying yes because it's the answer that they think I'm looking for, which is misses the point of a philosophy class. We're supposed to debate these things. But nonetheless, the idea that Nietzsche is getting at here is that you should become equal to your life and your choices and yourself right now and actually foster beliefs and actions and deeds that allow you to say yes to life rather than no to life. Because effectively, as we'll see from Twilight of the Idols, the metaphysics that we have adopted for ourselves 
by Nietzsche's estimation, fundamentally says no to life. Now, it's I've lingered for like bloody half an hour on, on, on the preamble to this. Now we're turning to Twilight of the Idols, or how one philosophizes with a hammer. Now, in the preface, right, what Nietzsche points out is that we're in the midst of a crisis, a, a cultural malaise, right? Um, uh, and what this calls for, first off, is cheerfulness, a life-affirming disposition in the midst of a gloomy affair, right? in the midst of a whole bunch of hollow life-denying values what we have to do is with cheerfulness with joyousness engage with what he calls a revaluation of all values he says a revaluation of all values oh i'm sorry this is on 465 this question mark so black so tremendous that it casts shadows upon the the man who puts it down such a destiny of a task compels one to run into the sun at every moment to shape, shake off a heavy, all too heavy seriousness. Every man is proper for this, <clears throat> or every means is proper for this. Every case, a case of luck, especially war. War has always been the great wisdom of all spirits who have become too entwined, too profound. Even in a wound, there is the power to heal. A maxim, the origin of which I withhold from uh, scholarly curiosity, has long been my motto, and it translates as spirits increase, vigor grows through a wound. So, effectively, what Nietzsche is claiming of these values, the ones that are pinned to this metaphysical belief system, the ones that we don't even think of as pinned to this metaphysical belief system, the one that's collapsed, Right? the one that we cannot rely on in a cultural sense to give meaning to our lives, they have become puffed up, they've become hollow, and as we'll see, they've always been serious. They've been grave, they've smelt with whiffs of the denial of life rather than the affirmation of life. Right? So effectively, what we have to do is engage in a revaluation of all values, and this is bloody well going to be hard. It's going to hurt. Right? It's going to, in a sense, wound us culturally, but we have to do it in order to, in a sense, cut out the canker and engage in healing. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Right? Another metaphor is that it, we first have to destroy in order to create something new. Right? We have to, in a sense, wound in order to, to use a metaphor that he uses in his Human All Too Human, another text of his, right? we have to wound in order to, in a sense, inoculate our culture with something new, something better, with something that affirms life. Right? Now, as I mentioned, right, um, the subtitle to this work is How One Philosophizes with a Hammer. Right. Let me see, where is the reference? Now, it's very, very tempting to think of this crazy old mustached Nietzsche running around with a sledgehammer, knocking down clay statues that are our idols and that sort of thing, and just engaging in this sort of violent revaluation. Right? Well, he says on two six or er, four sixty six, this essay too, it, the title betrays it, is above all a recreation, a, a, a recreation, a spot of sunshine, a leap sideways into uh, the idleness of a psychologist, perhaps a new war too, and <clears throat> and our new idol sounded out. This little essay is a great declaration of war. And regarding the sounding out of idols, this time they're not just the idols of our age, but eternal idols, which are to be touched with a hammer as with a tuning fork. There are altogether no older 
<clears throat> no more convinced, no more puffed up idols, and none more hollow. That does not prevent them from being those in which the people have the most faith, nor does one ever say idle, especially not in the most distinguished instance. Touched with the hammer as with a tuning fork. This isn't just going to be a violent frenzy that we're going to read here. What we're going to read here is going to be a, as he points it out, sounding out of idols. To hear if they ring true, to hear if they are in harmony with the dictates of a belief system that is healthy and life affirming. So without further ado, we'll skip over um, it just quickly the maxims and arrows. I'll point out one here um, from Nietzsche's Maxims and Arrows on the page 467, maxim number eight. Out of life school of war, what does not destroy me makes me stronger. So if you're ever asked that on Jeopardy, you've got the answer, who, who is Frederick Nietzsche? Right? If there's a, what does not kill me makes me stronger, right? that's where it comes from. That's, so nonetheless, right? um, you, you get the idea of the vigor and the strength and the naturalism that's present in Nietzsche's work kind of thing. The, the demands on you to become equal to the task of living a human life, which he points out is sort of a difficult thing. So this harkens back to a certain extent to Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard's treatment of despair, this evasive turning away from life, is something in a cultural sense that Nietzsche is very concerned about. All right? So these maxims right, are supposed to be sort of like tight, tightly tied knots of wisdom that you're supposed to meditate upon and think through and they're supposed to help you reorient your notion. They're sort of like Buddhist cones. Right. So um, you know, what I'm going to do is record a total of four, including this video of these videos, and put them together in a playlist. The first one, which we're just concluding now, is your sort of general introduction to Nietzsche's position, Nietzsche's criticism in the context of the death of God. It, it's called upon us to find value in our lives as we now live them because we cannot make recourse to a medical, me, metaphysical belief system that we culturally no longer believe in. What we have to do is, in turn, invigorate ourselves culturally and become equal to the task of living a, a human life. Twilight of the Idols is sort of going to do that in relation to a sustained criticism of uh, the puffed up and hollow values and belief systems that so basically what Twilight of the Idols wants to do is revalue our values by sounding them out and holding them to the standard of the affirmation of life saying yes to life saying yes to that bloody demon right? becoming equal to being ourselves right so um there are three sections of twilight of the idols that we're going to take a close look at the first is the problem of socrates where he's going to actually sort of invert Socrates' position and accuse Socrates of effectively engaging in a bait-and-switch with his cultural prescription for the ancient Athenians. Uh, um, the second section that we're going to take a look at is the reason uh, called reason, scare quotes, in philosophy. And um, in this section what he's going to treat is two idiosyncrasies of philosophers and we should given what you've taken in this class so far be in a position um, to, to sort of understand where he's coming from their references to the previous theorists that we've taken a look at um, then the third section and therefore the third video um, we're skipping over uh, how the true world finally became a fable it it's a beautiful and very you can see one page it's not even oh, two pages, it's a page and a quarter. Um, but nonetheless, what Nietzsche is trying to do is rely heavily on a, an understanding of the history of Western philosophy in terms of the evolution of our belief in um, truth or a true world. 
right? Um, so uh, we're going to skip over that because it requires a greater knowledge of the history of Western philosophy than than than, than what you've simply got in this course. We're going to switch over. Uh, we're going to jump over to the final section. We'll take a look at um, morality as anti-nature, which is you know, pretty substantial, right? Um, it, but nonetheless, um, that's what we will do in the videos that are to follow. So um, uh, this video that we're watching right now and additionally three videos, um, I'll conclude with a bit of a summary of Nietzsche's position. All right.